This evening we come to the book of Numbers, and they tell me that these are recorded and they're all up somewhere. I think you can find them on the website now and maybe on the church app and um, wherever else you find Spotify, Spotify, apparently. And so um, you can go back and listen to the others uh, if you missed them, although as Brent and I do this, we're only on the fourth week having come to Numbers, and we're already saying, boy, We've learned a lot. We may need to get uh, done and then circle back and redo the first five or six because we think that we're figuring out better ways to do this as we go. It is a challenge to do an overview of a whole book of the Bible. But uh, this evening, at any rate, we come to the book of Numbers. And I want to start with a couple verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The book of Numbers is so uh, long ago, it's buried back in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bibles. Uh, the Bible, it has odd stories in it, like a talking donkey. Um, it is a difficult book. It's a book that many do not have um, morning devotions in regularly. And so we have to ask, what does the book of Numbers mean for us today as Christians? Is it still relevant? Is it... Is it instructive for our lives? Well, I think the answer overwhelmingly is yes. So let me start with a few verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, specifically verse 6 and then 11 and 12. You see the Apostle Paul, when seeking to instruct the Corinthian church, reached exactly for the book of Numbers. And he says this, Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. It says in verse 11, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. (laughs) It was a direct biblical statement that the book of Numbers, and we'll see as we go that he is talking about the book of Numbers, was written down for our instruction as members of the New Testament church goes on to say in verse 12, therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So the New Testament tells us directly that the book of Numbers is there uh, as a warning for us so that if we think we can't fall victim to sin and unbelief, the book of Numbers stands as a perpetual reminder, oh yes you can and we need to be careful. We'll see this not only in 1 Corinthians, and we'll look at this passage more later, but also in the book of Hebrews. But let's start back in the book of Numbers, and I'll say this by way of review. I'm quoting Wilkinson and Boa here. In Genesis, God elected a people. In Exodus, he redeemed them. In Leviticus, he sanctified them. And in Numbers, he directed them. Or another way of saying that might be that Genesis is the book of beginnings. Exodus is the book of the law, we might say. Leviticus is the book of holiness. And Numbers is the book of wandering. By way of overview, God will be faithful to his promises. Those promises that he made throughout Genesis and Exodus. And he will uphold his righteousness in complete holiness, as we saw in Leviticus. Therefore, he will punish Israel for her faithless disobedience, we see here in the book of Numbers, and afterward will give her the land he promised. And we see by the end of Numbers that he is regrouping the nation, ready to send them into the land of promise. But in the book of Numbers, we have God, on the one hand, disciplining Israel for her disobedience and unbelief, but at the same time, showing himself faithful to his promise and preparing them to enter the promised land. In a word or two, the book of Numbers is about wandering and warning. It's about wandering and warning. In fact, Wandering would be a better title for the book and was the title of the book um, in the Jewish mind and uh, in centuries past. But the title Numbers comes to us uh, from the title of the Greek Old Testament um, where it got that name. 
And that's because of the two chapters in which the people of Israel are numbered. First in uh, uh, chapter 1 and later in chapter 26, I believe. And so, hence the name Numbers. But it's a bit of a tragedy because that's not what the book is about. It's just one small feature of the book. But in a word or two, it is about wandering and warning. Now, wandering best describes the content of the book of Numbers. Israel leaves Sinai and marches to the border of the promised land only to shrink back in doubt and fear and disobedience, refusing to enter the land and drive out its inhabitants. This is what God had told them to do, and they march in that direction, but ultimately refuse to obey. They are afraid and they don't believe that God will protect them. So for rejecting his purposeful directive to take the promised land, God sentences them to 40 years of aimless wandering in the barren wilderness. And that was one year for each day that Israel's spies surveyed the land, meaning God held them directly and specifically responsible for the knowledge they rejected. And in Numbers 14.34, God says, According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years, and you shall know my displeasure. So the book of Numbers, the content is about wandering, and specifically the nation of Israel is sentenced to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness aimlessly because of their unbelief and disobedience toward God. Now, in just a minute, we're going to read through a good part of Numbers 13 and 14 because that forms really the heart of the book and it's the clearest example of what's happening in terms of the people's disobedience against God, God's displeasure with them, then God's discipline of them. And I want you to see it for yourself. Instead of a flyover where we read a bunch of verses from 10 or 15 different chapters, we're going to slow down and read the majority of two chapters. And I think it's going to give you a flavor of the book of Numbers and really the heartbeat of the book of Numbers. So that when you later read it on your own, which I would highly encourage you to do this week with these themes rattling in your mind, um, you'll have... Uh, uh, an, an angle of attack. You'll have a frame in which to read the book. So Numbers is about wandering, and we'll see that firsthand in a minute, but warning best describes the purpose of the book. If wandering best describes the content of the book, warning best describes the purpose of the book. And we know that because both Paul and the writer of Hebrews looks to the narrative of Numbers as the example par excellence of the sins of doubting and disobeying God and then suffering the consequences. Now, we see this elsewhere, of course, in the Old Testament. Namely, all of the Old Testament. (laughs) But here in the record of God's dealings with his people and getting them into the promised land, it shines most, um, I say brightly, but it's not bright, most clearly, in the book of Numbers, and therefore the New Testament writers often look to the book of Numbers as the clearest example of disbelief leading to disobedience requiring the discipline of the Lord. Paul uses Numbers as an example in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13, where he's teaching the sinful Corinthians how to consider others before self to make decisions that benefit the holiness of the body to which they belong. That's in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 with the idol meat controversy. Um, And this results in our favorite verse about battling sin, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which we often take in isolation. But I think it's even more powerful when we see it in its context of Paul using numbers to instruct the sinful church there in Corinth. And then the writer to Hebrews uses numbers as an example in Hebrews 3, 7 to 4, 13, 
when encouraging Christians to press on to the end in their faith. And he warns readers against the kind of evil, unbelieving hearts present in the first generation of Israelites after the Exodus. He'll do that in Hebrews 3.12, resulting in one of our favorite verses about the power of God's word. In Hebrews 4.12, which we often take in isolation, but it means even more and shines with more vibrant colors and is applicable in a slightly different way when we understand it in the context of an example of numbers as a warning for Christians today. That's how we need to understand Hebrews um, 4.12, about the word being alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Now, after we've read these two key chapters of Numbers, 13 and 14, then we're going to return to both of these examples so that we can better understand what Numbers means for our lives today, followed by a, a final example thereafter. But just a word then on the structure of Numbers. We're not going to read a bunch of verses from these chapters, but roughly chapters 1 through 10. Really, it's 1 through 10, chapter 10, verse 11. But you can think of it as chapters 1 through 10 contain the organization and preparation of Israel to occupy the promised land. It's the organization and the preparation of Israel to occupy the promised land. God has created them. He has elected them, creating them through Abraham and his descendants in Genesis. In Exodus, God has saved them. He's redeemed them from slavery in Egypt, brought them out of Egypt and gave them the law. That was the constitution that they would live under, if you will. In Leviticus, he explains exactly what holiness will look like. Um, God is protecting his holiness from corruption so that he can come and live among them, and he's protecting them from his holiness as he comes and lives among them. And so now in the book of Numbers, they have what they need, and God organizes and prepares them to go into the promised land. It is time. It is time, he says. You will march on now and fulfill these promises that I've been making to you. Well, it doesn't quite happen like that. Because in Numbers chapters 11 to 25, we see Israel's disobedience and God's 40-year discipline in the wilderness. Chapters 11 to 25, Israel's disobedience and God's 40-year discipline in the wilderness. And unfortunately, it wasn't one act of disobedience. They disobey over and over and over, proving that God was just in disciplining them in the way that he did. Um, and so it was a cycle of unbelief and grumbling and discipline and uh, unholiness and more discipline for 40 years until the entire first generation of Israelites, 20 years old and older, died out. Then 40 years later, we see chapters 12, uh, I'm sorry, that's a typo, that should say chapters 26 to 36. Chapters 26 to 36. And we get the reorganization and preparation of Israel to occupy the promised land. Um, God starts over where he began. Just as in the chapter 1, we have this census of the people so that they knew how many they had and were responsible for and who would live where. Um, now it's time to start over. And God, in his infinite grace, after exactly a just amount of discipline, reorganizes and prepares them to march now into the land. And so we get that in the third section, chapters 26 to 36. So if you read through Numbers this week, that's what you'll deal with, uh, those three major sections. But let's jump now, let's parachute in directly to the heart of Numbers. Why is it a book of wandering? Why didn't they just go in and occupy the land? What were they afraid of? God had made these soaring promises, and then they saw with their own eyes God's deliverance. They saw 10 plagues in Egypt. They saw a parting of the Red Sea. They saw God. They heard him come down on the mountain and speak. Why didn't they say, God, <clears throat> with you all things are possible. <laughs> we can't lose. Let's go. Well, we're going to see why as we read through uh, quite a few verses in Numbers 13 and 14. And so um, you can turn there now, Numbers 13, verse 1. 
the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, um, every one a chief among them, all twelve tribes represented, and a leader from all twelve tribes represented, so that they can come back with a, a trustworthy, authoritative account of what awaits them in the land of promise. It also means that these leaders will be responsible for the witness that they bear, and their tribes will then be duly responsible because their leader is responsible. So God is putting the entire nation on the hook to go and examine um, this beautiful promised land flowing with milk and honey um, that he has called them to occupy. Jumping down to verse 25 of Numbers 13, at the end of 40 days... 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, meaning they got a really good look at it because Israel is roughly the size of New Jersey. You can Google that and look at a comparison map. It ain't big. Even on foot, you can get a pretty good look of the whole thing in 40 days if you keep moving end to end. Verse 26, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They brought back physical samplings of the fruit to the people who were camped just south of the land. Verse 27, and they told him, uh, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However... The people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. And then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. Now, immediately we can see that ten of the spies, we'll see as we go, are looking at what? What is their focus on? Their focus is on the people. Their focus is on the inhabitants of the land. Some of them are giants. Some of them live in big walled cities. And there's multiple groups of them living throughout all the regions of the land. Their focus is on the people. And their focus is on what else? Not just the other people, but who? Themselves. Their focus is on the other people, and their focus is on themselves. Meaning, they intend to trust in their own size and strength and ingenuity and military might. But whose focus is Caleb on? It must be on the Lord. He doesn't say that yet, but it must be. He simply says, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Because his understanding of Israel's ability depends entirely upon God with them. He's looking at God's might and then at their ability. But let's read on. We turn now into chapter 14, verse 1. Let's see who the congregation will listen to. Will they listen? to the ten, to all of the spies minus 
Joshua, Caleb, or will they listen to Caleb's word? Will they say, we have heard the promises of God. Uh, We know what God promised in Genesis. We know what he's just promised us in our hearing in Exodus. Let's see, Numbers 14, verse 1, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night, and all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. This is a wholesale rejection of God, his word, his promises, and his chosen leader. That's what their fear has led them to. Verse 5, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Now, what happens next in verses 10 to 16, is that God expresses a desire to kill Israel and start a new nation with Moses. He says, Moses, I'm going to kill them all. Let's start over with you. But Moses intercedes on behalf of the people, appealing to God to forgive Israel for the sake of his own reputation in the world and reminding God of the promises that he had made. He doesn't say, oh God, but we are worthy. He doesn't say, oh God, but there is some worthiness left in your people. He doesn't say, God, do it for me. We're friends. You talk to me as, uh, as though it were face to face. What he says is, God, in essence, he says, you're right. But God, the whole world is watching because of what you just did in the events of the Exodus. And all the nations around the known world are already saying, because word has spread in the year um, that we've been here, God, everyone knows what's happening, and they say that you, Yahweh, the one God, travel with your people in cloud by day and fire by night. God, if you destroy these people, it will besmirch your name in the world. And also, God, you have promised to be gracious and merciful. Imagine being Moses in this moment, interceding and pleading with God and reminding God of his promises. What a man. Look at Numbers 14, verse 17 and following. Moses says, And now, please, let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. You see, unlike the Israelites, Moses had listened when God had revealed himself. Moses took God at his word and remembered exactly the way God had revealed himself to Moses because he had already written it down. It was already collected in what was becoming the book of Exodus. And he says, God, this is how you described yourself, meaning, God, I know that you can forgive even these people. Verse 19, 
Moses continues, please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love. Whew, that's a prayer. Just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now, Father, based on nothing but the greatness of your promise-keeping love. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give their fathers. And none of those who despised me shall see it. Jumping down to verse 28, God says, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and all of your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Jumping down to verse 34, according to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years, and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this will I do to all this wicked generation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. That is why Numbers is a book of wandering. Because of this great sin of wholesale unbelief, disobedience, and rejection of God, his word, and his prophet over them. God said, I'm going to discipline you in my holiness, in my righteousness. One year for each of the days that I allowed you to spy out the land, I'm going to discipline you. But, but, he's saying, I will send you into the land where I swore to take you. It's just not going to be this first generation. It's going to be the second generation. It's an act of radical grace on the part of God. And so we see that the promises that proliferated from the lips of God through his prophets in Genesis and Exodus, he will fulfill. But we also see that the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, as described in Leviticus, will also be upheld. And so we see what might be a very good summary for the book of Numbers, or really indeed the entire Old Testament or Bible, and it is simply God's faithfulness despite his people's unfaithfulness. It might be a very good title or summary for the book of Numbers, but really for the entire Old Testament and quite possibly for the whole Bible. God's faithfulness despite his people's unfaithfulness. So, Numbers is a book of wandering. That word best describes its content. But Numbers is also a book of warning. For us today, that word probably best describes its purpose. And I want to walk through these two um, not-so-long New Testament passages and just make a few comments so you can see how God, by his Spirit, was pleased to use the book of Numbers uh, in writing the New Testament covenant and writing the new covenant turn in your bibles to first corinthians chapter 10 we'll start in verse 1 and again paul is writing to a church that looked a lot like the nation of israel in the days of numbers these are god's people these are christians in the church in corinth there are many genuine christians among them and there are some who are professing christians only but they are God's people, and he will work with them. And so he has sent Paul as an apostle to love them, to shepherd them, 
to write letters to them. And Paul recognizes that the, na- that, uh, the church in Corinth looks a bit like the nation of Israel in her lower points, racked with sin. And so Paul reaches for the book of Numbers as a sobering warning to the people in Corinth as he's teaching them the consequences of sin and as he's teaching them to consider those consequences and to put others first as they make decisions regarding morality and holiness. Because they must learn to be a people holy unto the Lord together as God's new covenant people. And so how interesting that even when he's ironing out highly specific cultural issues in the local church in Corinth, like should we or should we not eat meat sacrificed to idols, the Apostle Paul says, well, first you need to put each other first. And stop demanding your own rights. Secondly, you need to understand that you're working toward a group holiness in this. But thirdly, and I think the reason he's reaching um, for the book of Numbers is to remind them just how high the cost of disobedience is. Now look at this. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food. Boy, does this sound familiar after our overviews of Exodus and Leviticus. We've got the crossing of the Red Sea. We have manna. We have the glory cloud of God coming down among the people. Verse 4, and all drank the same spiritual drink. Moses, of course, gave, oh, he says, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Oh, no time to stop there now. But listen to that. We know that they drank from water that came from a rock from the hand of God through Moses miraculously. Why is he bringing all this up? Verse 5, nevertheless... With most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What is he referring to? Numbers 14, 29. Your dead body shall fall in this wilderness, and all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me. Paul is getting serious in this letter. Now, some in Corinth certainly were Gentile Christians, but most of them by this time would have become familiar with the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. Some of the Christians there in Corinth were certainly Jews, and they knew full well. And when Paul made this mention of them being overthrown in the wilderness, the hair on the back of their neck stood up because they said the Apostle Paul, God's authoritative representative, the Lord Christ's authoritative representative has just told us that we could die in the wilderness, as it were, just as quickly as that first generation of Israelites after the Exodus. You say, no, wait a minute, Pastor. Is he really saying that? Is he really threatening them in that way? Yes, because in just a few chapters, when he describes to them why they're doing communion wrong, and prescribes how to do it right. He says, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep, have died. And so Paul is grabbing hold of numbers to give them the strongest warning he can to tell them, your uh, obedience to the Lord Jesus in this community of God's people is serious. It matters. It can even be a matter of life and death before the Lord. Now, verse 6, he continues, Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Numbers 11, 4, Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. They wanted meat. The people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. The manna was not good enough. They demanded meat. Paul says, watch out when you start to give in to your evil desires. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. 
As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's an Exodus reference. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. Numbers 25.9, nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. Uh-oh, there's a discrepancy. Clearly, the Bible is full of errors and is not to be trusted. Say, children on YouTube that have never read a book. Um, but understand that in one context, when Scripture says 23,000, and in the New Testament says 24,000, do you notice that that's a ginormous round number? And it's designed to be a round number because in the same way that you round numbers almost daily, probably in some way or another, what time is it? About 11 o'clock. How many people were there? I don't know, 500. Well, Scripture also uses round numbers all the time. And so perhaps there's 23,500 people that the Lord struck down in the wilderness, and so one can very accurately say 23,000, while the other very accurately says 24,000. And so I just say that because sometimes I hear people arguing that these uh, somehow (laughs) disprove Scripture, but to say that is to understand neither language nor literature. But let's move on, verse 9. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. This is all the language of Numbers, nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. Happened to them as an example, written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come, meaning we now are in the fulfillment of these promises of the Messiah in the church age. Verse 12, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Numbers 21.5 says, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food or water and we loathe this worthless food. And so Paul uses the example of the children of Israel in the book of Numbers, to say, take heed, lest you fall. When you rebel against God, act in unbelief, act in disobedience, and spurn God's good grace to you. And it's in that context that we get this, the very next verse. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. What does this mean? This is in the context of envisioning yourself as one of the Egyptians, uh, the Israelites rather, marching along, having been delivered from the Egyptians, being called to go into the land of Canaan, and being able to trust God that he will overcome any and every obstacle in your way. And when you are tempted to throw in the towel because it seems too difficult or too scary or too big a thing for you to handle, you are to remember the children of Israel in the book of Numbers. Numbers 14, 8, you are to stand up like Caleb and say, if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. Just don't rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protections removed. The Lord is with us. Paul is saying, don't accept a shortcut. Don't accept a shortcut of sin in venting your anger, in trying to fulfill the, the cravings of your flesh, in giving in uh, uh, to, to sinful worry. Uh, in whatever it might be that all of us struggle with. Paul says, remember the Israelites. Remember Caleb and Joshua. Remember that there were those that understood. And when they finally obeyed God, he cleared every obstacle and miraculously placed them in that land, and he will do it for you also. He will do it for you also as one of his new covenant people. When you take God at his word, you cling to his promises, and you move forward in faith, doing the next faithful 
thing. Let no temptation overcome you to stray from the path. Now, in similar fashion, we get Hebrews 3, 7 to 4, 13. Let me just read through this with far less comment just to show you that the writer of the Hebrews does a very similar thing. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. This is the entirety of the book of Numbers, right? Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And Hebrews is quoting the Psalms often here, but the Psalms are quoting Numbers. Verse 12, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. That sounds like Numbers 20, 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Back to Hebrews 3, 13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. As Israel, so it is possible for you to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Specifically, what kind of deceitfulness of sin? The kind of deceitfulness of sin that makes you look at others or yourself or the temptation before you or the difficulty of the path of obedience and saying, I can't do it. Because of that obstacle or because of my weakness, I can't do it. I must veer from the path. That's the kind of disobedience, the kind of of deceitfulness of sin that's being spoken of. Verse 14, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. This is all numbers language. If you've read Hebrews without knowing numbers, you missed something. But now you can go and read not only numbers, but Hebrews with greater insight. Verse 16, for Who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left um, Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Numbers 14, 2, and all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or that we had died in this wilderness. In verse 29 of Numbers 14, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness and all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me. Hebrews 4, 1, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands... Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. (laughs) Isn't that beautiful? They had the good news. What was that good news? Why, it was the same as we have. It is not different. It's identical. It was God promising to redeem them and fulfill every promise to them in and through his Messiah to save them to the uttermost for all of eternity. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. Just as they were on the path to the temporary rest of life in the promised land under Yahweh in the the theocracy, then monarchy that was uh, promised, So we as Christians today are on our way to the eternal promised rest of shalom, of peace in God's presence on a new earth, right? We've talked a little about biblical theology, and I get a hair off topic, but the Garden of Eden was a special sense of God's presence. That got ruined. But then the tabernacle was the beginning of the restoration of that sense of God's holy presence on the earth. And it spread out into the people of Israel. 
and then out further into the land of Israel. And it was through Israel that God brings his Messiah to ultimately save an entire people unto himself, numbering like the stars and like sand on the seashore, which will one day fill the earth. But not until the end, when Christ returns and new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven and Christ reigns for all of eternity on a renewed earth, that holiness will spread throughout that progression of history. But let's continue on. Verse 3, For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. God is working out his eternal decree of salvation. Verse 4, For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Verse 6, Hebrews 4, Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day today saying through David so long afterwards, and the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. Well, the rest in the promised land under Joshua was not the eternal fulfilled rest. There was a far greater rest coming that we look forward to as well. Verse 9, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. We said in conversation before um, the service began this evening, that whenever someone speaks of their salvation in the past tense, looking primarily back to a prayer that they prayed or a card that they signed or an aisle that they walked or some other thing in a moment of time in the past on which they are now presently banking, there's a problem. The book of Numbers stands as an ongoing warning for believers today that following hard after God is a lifestyle. Those with regenerate, renewed hearts follow. Jesus says we take up our cross and follow him. It's a daily endeavor of dependence and obedience. And we will never do it perfectly. And ironically, the more holiness you gain with the help of the Spirit, the less holy you might feel. And yet we can follow clearly. Let us therefore strive. We continue to follow Christ and the power of the gospel day after day as he makes us more and more like Christ. We strive to enter that rest in the Christian life so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Now here we come to verse 12 of Hebrews 4. It is in this context of striving hard after God despite the difficulties of obedience over a lifetime that we read for, notice that that's a continuation word, for the word of God is living and acting and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Amazing, the writer of the Hebrews takes up this military imagery, saying to the one who needs strength and pressing on, on the one hand, you have the sword of the word. You have the deadliest weapon of all. Why are you afraid? What possible obstacle do you think you can't overcome when you're wielding the living and active sword of the Lord? But understand, too, that that same sword pierces inward to the division of soul and spirit and revealing your thoughts and intentions to the Lord. Incredible. The same implement gives us tremendous strength and power as we press on and the strength of the Lord in obedience seeking to enter that rest. And it's also a reminder that the God who is with us sees within and knows the thoughts and intentions of our heart. 
That's so encouraging when we've opened ourselves up fully to his grace and forgiveness and sanctification. And it's startling when we've wandered and we stand in sin. And that's a good thing because it chases us back onto the path where we can find full forgiveness and restoration unto fellowship, according to 1 John 1, 9 and countless other passages. I just love that these key verses like 1 Corinthians 10, 13 about battling sin and Hebrews 4, 12 about the word, both come in this context of pressing on within a vision of numbers laid out for us to encourage us as we press on in the faith. Genesis 7, 8, why? What was this word that they were to be trusting in in the days uh, of uh, just after the Exodus. Well, words like this, Genesis 17, 8, God had said, I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings and all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And in Exodus 33, 1, God had said, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your offspring, I will give it. The nation of Israel, save a remnant, had put this sword of the Lord back in its sheath. They weren't looking at it, weren't listening to it, weren't even attempting to use it. They tucked those promises away and ignored them. They acted in complete unbelief and therefore disobedience to God. They didn't believe that he was strong enough to get them through. They'd rather go back to Egypt or die in the wilderness than trust and Almighty God. And the writer to the Hebrews is saying, don't repeat their mistake. Take up the sword of the Lord. Move forward in the power of the Lord by grabbing hold of God's promises, refusing to doubt them, praying them over and over and over when you do doubt them and confessing that to the Lord because we all doubt at times and saying, Father, renew my strength, renew my faith, help so that God will send you forward. Not in your own power because you have none. The weaker you feel, the better you are in position to receive strength from the Lord. If you have drugged yourself in here this evening feeling immensely weak under the burden of the world, you of all people stand ready to receive grace and strength and power from God. Of all people, do not despair. Go home this very evening, grab hold of the promises of the word and cry out to God for help. And he will answer. He will answer. You must know that. Finally, how can God fulfill his promises to pardon sinners and punish their sin fully? What a beautiful example we get from the book of Numbers that I skipped over earlier in the mention of um, fiery serpents. The New Testament gives us an example uh, New Testament uses an example from Numbers in another significant context, this time giving us one of our favorite verses on the power of God to save. Every time Numbers shows up, one of our favorite verses pops out. Isn't that interesting? And if we know the book of Numbers better, those verses become even more favorites because they shine with more vivid color and deeper dimension. Here's uh, Numbers 21, 4 through 9 for another sampling of the um, stories from Numbers and their theological significance. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. You know, I would... I would say, how dare they, if I did not harbor in my own heart so often ingratitude toward the Lord. And I never realize it at first because of the deceitfulness of sin. It just creeps in <laughs> as I'm fixing the house or working on a car or doing something. And I find slowly my attitude moves from one of joy and doing what's needful to frustration or whatever it might be. And all of a sudden I find that I am no longer thankful to God for the good things he has given me. I'm grumbling and complaining under my breath. And every time that happens to me, I am not doing anything at all different 
than what the people of Israel are doing, except this, that I am infinitely more blessed than the people of Israel in their wanderings. And so my sin is certainly more odious to the Lord when it happens. You see, we've got to read the Old Testament, not picking on the people we read, but seeing ourselves as though in a mirror. The book of Numbers was written as a warning, but let's press on. Verse 6, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, Make fiery, a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, the fiery serpent on a pole raised up, shall live. When he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, what kind of a crazy story is this? Well, remember what I've argued. I believe that what God did in the Old Testament did not set a pattern that God then reactively used to shape the life and events of Jesus. I believe that God planned redemption from the beginning. And I believe that God shaped the events and life and history of Israel to prefigure the events of the life of Christ and his redeeming work. The book of John, chapter 3, one of our favorite chapters in the Bible, leads up to one of our favorite verses in the Bible, And surprise, surprise, it springs immediately, directly from a a reference to this very story in the book of Numbers. John chapter 3, starting in verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When John wrote these words, or Jesus spoke them, and we're not sure which, if this is John's commentary or still Jesus speaking. Either way, John 3.16 comes from Jesus or John envisioning Moses lifting up the serpent on the bronze, uh, the bronze serpent on a staff and everyone infected by this deadly venom looking on this raised symbol for life. John or Jesus says in the same way, it's the Son of Man that will be lifted up, as it were, on a pole so that all who look to him will have the venom and the poison of sin removed. It will be transferred to him and removed from you so that you can live eternally. Without the book of Numbers, we would never have been given John 3.16. Is Numbers relevant for our lives today? (laughs) I believe it is. I believe it is. So I hope that you'll consider reading Numbers through this week with a new framework within which to view it. Then maybe jump into 1 Corinthians and Hebrews uh, for ongoing devotions and see what you can see there that maybe shines forth with a little more light. Let's pray, and then I'll take questions for any who have time to stay.